Dr. Martin Zamatolsky was an educated man. He thought it was extremely unlikely that any phosphorus would be in the paint as this had never been hinted to be an ingredient. Without having run a single test, he wrote sagely to Roach on January 30th, 1923. It is my belief that the serious condition of the jaw has been caused by the influence of radium. Finally, <laughs> finally, we have someone saying the obvious. Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm Jess Cannell, and if you are new, then welcome. I hope to earn your subscription today. In this video, we are going through Radium Girls. This is Kate Moore's book about, it says, The Dark Story of America's Shining Women. And we have heard the beginnings of a few of the young ladies getting their jobs at this Radium Corporation. And in our last episode, which was episode two, we started seeing some of the outplay of some of the medical problems. But today, ooh, brace yourselves, we are getting into it. Here we go. Chapter six. This is in Ottawa, Illinois, September, 1922. Two days after Molly's funeral and 800 miles away from Orange, a small advertisement appeared in the local paper of a little town called Ottawa in Illinois. Girls wanted, several girls, 18 years or over for fine brushwork. This is a studio proposition. The work is clean and healthful, surroundings pleasant, and then it gave instructions about how to apply. Of course, it sounded wonderful. Ottawa was a tiny town, population 10,816, located 85 miles southwest of Chicago. It was the kind of place where its banks proclaimed themselves to be where friendliness reigns, and local businesses advertised their location as being one block north of the post office. It was the heart of rural Illinois, surrounded by farmland and the impossibly wide skies of the Midwest. It was a place where folks were happy simply to get on with life, raise their families, do good work, live decent lives. The community was close-knit and emphatically religious. The majority of the residents, Catholic. It was the perfect populace then for a new dial painting opportunity. It wasn't the United States Radium Corporation hiring, although they knew their competitor well. This was the Radium Dial Company. Its president was Joseph A. Kelly. It was to Miss Murray that the girls would apply. Lottie Murray was an intensely loyal employee. A slim, single woman, 44 years old, who had been with the company five years as its studio moved around various locations before settling in Ottawa. One of her very first successful applicants was 19-year-old Catherine Wolfe. She was Ottawa-born and bred, a devoted parishioner of St. Columba Church. She already had had some hard knocks in life. When she was only six, her mother Bridget had passed away. Just four years later, in 1913, her father Maurice died from lung trouble. Ten-year-old Catherine had been sent to live with her elderly aunt and uncle, Mary and Winchester Moody Begart. What a name. Sharing their home at 520 East Superior Street. She was a shy, quiet person, unassuming, and the job at the studio would be her first, painting the dials of timepieces and aeronautical instruments. It was fascinating work and the pay was good, she said, but every line had to be just so. And there was only one way to get the necessary point on the quote, Japanese brushes that were the size of a pencil that these girls used. Catherine remembered, Miss Lottie Murray taught us how to point camel hair brushes with our tongues. We would first dip the brush into water, then into the powder, and then point the ends of the bristles between our teeth. It was the lip dip paint routine all over again, but with an entirely new cast. 16-year-old Charlotte Nevins joined the crew. The ad had said 18 years or over, but she wasn't gonna let a little thing like that stop her. 
Charlotte was the youngest of six siblings and perhaps she just wanted to grow up fast. Charlotte wasn't the only one to tweak the truth about her age. Another employee did the same, Mary Vicini, a sweet Italian girl who had come to America as a baby. She was only 13 in 1922, but nonetheless, she made it into the coveted workforce. In truth, the nimble fingers of prepubescent girls suited the delicate work of dial painting. Records show that some were as young as 11. Mm. One of you commented this week that this story is too painful and I agree, it is a very painful story and that's why I'm trying to move at a good clip because I feel like my heart can only take so much. So if you'll hang in here with me for this story, we will suck the good things from it. We will celebrate the justice that hopefully comes. Um, but we will also feel the painful things and 11 years old and 13 years old and really any of them doing this lip painting routine is just very difficult. This is a difficult story. Like Miss Murray, Reed, Rufus Reed was the assistant superintendent. He and his wife Mercedes had been with the company for years. Mercy Reed was famed for her instruction. Quote, she ate the luminous material with a spatula to show the girls that it was harmless, end quote. She would lick it right in front of them. Charlotte Nevins remembered, they always told me the radium would never hurt me. They even encouraged us to paint rings on our fingers and paint our dress buttons and buckles. And I just wanna note, this is a step beyond the orange factory. They're making claims that are, are extraordinary, that are specifically about this being super safe, taking it into their own bodies, eating it, and then encouraging the girls to put it on things that would be more permanent on their bodies, like a ring that they're painting on or dress buttons that would go home with them. This is a step beyond. The girls did exactly as they were instructed. They frequently practiced their painting, especially in the fields of fashion and art. Lots of them took paint home. One woman even painted her walls with it for interior decorating with a difference. Radium dial seems not to have been as concerned as USRC had been about wasting material. Former employees report that the radium was handled carelessly. And I just noted on the side, perhaps this was a different formulation. I don't know, but I just wonder if something was changing in regard to expense that would make them be a little more careless about it. The girls were the envy of others in the little Illinois town when they stepped out with their boyfriends at night, their dresses and hats, and sometimes even their hands and faces aglow with the phosphorence of the luminous paint. A young local girl recalled, oh, I used to wish I could work there. It was the elite job for the poor working girls. Catherine remembered, when I went home and washed my hands in a dark bathroom, they would appear luminous and ghostly. When I walked along the street, I was aglow from the radium powder. They worked six days a week using a similar greenish white paint to that that was used in orange with identical ingredients. Okay, and identical ingredients, interesting. And the girls were expected to work, work, work. Catherine recalled, we used to eat our lunches right beside the workbenches near the luminous paint and brushes which we used. We hurried to eat as fast as we could. After all, we made more money that way. The girls declared we were extremely happy in our work. Their manual for employees read, we expect you to work hard and the pay is accordingly large. If you do not expect to work hard and carefully, you are in the wrong place. But for Catherine and Charlotte and Mary, this felt like the right place indeed. Now we're back chapter seven to Newark, New Jersey, November, 1922. Miss Irene Rudolph, Irene got tentatively off to her feet as she heard her name being called by Dr. Barry and shuffled into his office. Her trouble had started first in her feet, though they were currently the least of her troubles. It was now her mouth that was the real problem. She had been attending this dental practice since August, though she'd been having tooth trouble since spring of 1922. 
Despite the attentions of various dentists, her condition had worsened. And in May, she had had to give up her job in a corset factory. Without a job, yet with increasing medical bills, Irene soon found her financial position precarious. She'd been sensible when she had been a, a dial painter, squirreling away her high wages, but her mysterious condition had exhausted her hard earned savings. With every expensive appointment, she hoped for improvement. As she levered herself into Dr. Barry's chair, she opened her mouth wide and prayed that this time he would have good news to offer. Walter Berry, an experienced dentist of 42, had deepening confusion as he looked into Irene's mouth. Every course of treatment they tried, cutting out the diseased bone in her mouth, removing teeth, these things only seemed to increase her suffering. No textbook or medical journal on the shelves that they could find had anything to do with a solution. As Barry examined her mouth, there was more infection, inflaming her empty gums with an unhealthy yellow sheen. James Davidson, his partner, had experience of treating Fossey jaw. And he said, I immediately started to question Irene as to what her occupation was. Now this is like Dr. Neff before, right? He said, I made an effort to ascertain whether there was any phosphorus in the material that she was using. Unknowingly, he was following the footsteps of Dr. Neff, who had treated Molly Magia, but the two investigations did not cross. He, Dr. Neff hadn't had the opportunity to share his discoveries, how Molly's jaw was destroyed faster and faster the more that he treated her and the more he removed teeth, the more the decline accelerated. As Catherine Schaub later noted, the word radium was never brought into it. Radium was such an established medical boon that it was almost beyond reproach. People did not question it. Well, in December, Irene took a turn for the worse and she was admitted to the hospital. She was shockingly pale and found to be anemic. Although Irene's dentists may not have crossed paths with Neff, the Dial Painter's friendships were a strong network. And by now, Irene had heard about Molly's death. The gossip mongers were saying syphilis had killed her, but the girls who knew her found that hard to believe. So while in the hospital, Irene told her doctor that there had been another girl who had had symptoms just like hers, who had died only a few months before. And then she told the doctor something else. Another girl was sick. She could have met Helen Quinlan, who had been taken ill with a severe sore throat and swollen face. She also had had trouble with a tooth and was showing signs of anemia. But they seemed not to have, have moved in the same circles. It was Hazel Vincent that she was referring. So you can see there's already multiple layers of people now falling sick, being hospitalized. This is going to continue. Hazel had been told that she was suffering from anemia and another condition, pyorrhea. Her doctor too suspected Fossey Jaw because there was a garlic odor to the ooze coming from her mouth and nose. Hazel's childhood sweetheart, Theo, was worried sick. In Irene's opinion, Hazel's case and hers were just too similar to be discounted as mere coincidence. All the evidence suggested that it was an occupational problem. On December 26, 1922, Alan, a doctor at this hospital, reported Irene Rudolph as a case of phosphorus poisoning to the Industrial Hygiene Division and asked them to investigate. The authorities launched straight into action, and within days, an inspector was at the Orange Plant looking into the claims of industrial poisoning. The inspector was escorted up to the dial painting studio by Harold Veet, a vice president of USRC. Together, they quietly observed the girls at work. There were not many anymore. Dial painting had become a seasonal occupation, and so the girls did not work continuously anymore. Yet the inspector noted with some incredulity, the universal practice of lip pointing. It was called to the attention of Mr. Veet and Veet told him that he had warned the girls time and again of this dangerous practice, but he could not get them to stop it. 
Had the dial painters overheard this conversation, they would probably have been stunned. Other than Sabine von Sashiki's one-off warning to Grace Fryer that lip pointing would make her ill, not a single other dial painter, including the instructresses and four women, ever reported a warning being issued, and certainly not that one that referenced lip pointing as being a dangerous practice. On the contrary, the girls had received countless assurances of the exact opposite. On the whole, the firm left them to get on with their work without interference. It didn't in truth really seem to care just how the women dial painted as long as the material wasn't wasted and the work got done. The inspector continued observing and he noted a matronly woman who was older than the rest appearing to be limping as she carried her dials up to the new forelady. Sarah Mailfair was limping. She was getting old, she supposed. She was now 33, and you should expect a few aches and pains as you get older. Plus, it was exhausting being a working mother. She didn't have the energy to keep up with her sister, Marguerite, her work, and her 11-year-old daughter. She felt blessed that the company was so understanding about her limp. A foreman of the company even took her to and from work each day because of her trouble walking. The inspection concluded with that official taking a paint sample for testing. That's good. And he sent it on to a man at the Department of Labor with the recommendation that that team make a survey of this plant as it is outside of our jurisdiction. So an, an additional inspection took place in the next few weeks. The inspector Lillian Erskine delivered her findings on January 25th. And Erskine took a rather different approach she spoke with an authority on radium and she informed Roach that no reports of necrosed bones as a result of radium treatment exist. She therefore concluded this case, Irene Rudolph, and the second reported case of Hazel Vincent are probably just an accidental coincidence resulting from abscessed teeth and incompetent dental surgery. Roach arranged for the plant to be tested, that's good, by a chemist. Dr. Martin Zamatolsky was an educated man. He thought it was extremely unlikely that any phosphorus would be in the paint as this had never been hinted to be an ingredient. Without having run a single test, he wrote sagely to Roach on January 30th, 1923. It is my belief that the serious condition of the jaw has been caused by the influence of radium. Finally. <laughs> Finally, we have someone saying the obvious, it has to be this other chemical. This was a radical idea, yet it did have some science to back it up. In a bibliography of radium studies, just four months before, there was an article headlined, Radium Dangers, Injurious Effects. In fact, articles as far back as 1906 detailed the dangers that radium could bring. The company later conceded that there were a considerable number of articles outlining the hazards from the early 20th century. A woman had even died in Germany in 1912. The doctor of that case had said one cannot doubt for a moment that radium poisoning was the cause. Yet the flip side of the coin was all the positive literature about radium. As early as 1914, specialists knew that radium could deposit in the bones of radium users and that it caused changes in their bloods, but they interpreted those blood changes as a positive thing. It seemed to stimulate blood marrow. It seemed to stimulate bone marrow production. And so to them, radium was a gift that kept on giving. It made the body do better at producing what was needed to produce those extra red blood cells. But if you looked a little closer at all those positive publications, there was a common denominator. The researchers on the whole worked for radium firms. Here you have a situation where if people are policing themselves without government oversight, this can happen. And this is where capitalism needs that good check of faithful governance, not overbearing regulation. And yet we need some regulation to protect it so that money grubbing 
business owners would not take short-term gain for long-term harm produced by their products. The firms that profited from Radium Medicine were the primary producers and publishers of the positive literature. This is why we don't want a purely capitalist system in an anarchical situation. Zamatolsky himself was a conscientious man, and given that his tests would take a few months, mindful of the fact that the work was continuing in a dial painting studio, he took care and added a note to his letter of January 30th. He wrote plainly, I would suggest that every operator be warned through a printed leaflet of the dangers of getting this material on their skin or into the system, especially the mouth, and that they be forced to use the utmost cleanliness. Yet, for some reason, this did not happen. Perhaps the message was never passed on. Oh, it makes me sad. Perhaps the company chose to ignore it. As 1923 drew on and Zamatolsky ran his tests, Irene Rudolph had been sent home from the hospital, continuing to endure horrible ulcers and sores, the same as those that had tortured poor Molly. Irene's anemia grew more serious, as did Helen Quinlan's. They were pale, weak creatures with no energy or life left in them. Not a single treatment helped and they weren't the only ones who were sick. Since George Willis, the co-founder of that orange company, had been ousted, things had deteriorated for him. It seemed a long time ago that he had thoughtlessly carried tubes of radium with his bare hands every day at work. But all time is relative. With a half-life of 1,600 years, radium could take its time to make itself known. As the months had passed since his departure from the company, Willis had sickened. And in September 1922, the same month that Molly died, he had had his right thumb amputated. Tests revealed it was riddled with cancer. He published his findings in the February 1923 edition of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. He wrote, quote, the reputation for harmlessness enjoyed by radium may after all depend on the fact that so far, not very many persons have been exposed to large amounts of radium by daily handling over long periods. There is good reason to fear that the neglect of precautions may result in serious injury to the radium workers themselves. We don't know what his former company thought of this article. No one, it seemed, took much notice of this small article. By the April of 1923, Zamatolsky had completed his tests. As he had suspected, there was not a single trace of phosphorus in the luminous paint. I feel quite sure, he therefore wrote on April 6, 1923, that the opinion expressed in my former letter is correct. Such trouble as may have been caused, is due to the radium. This is the first evidence-based, clear opinion that's been issued. Someone who has done the testing, issued a warning, been responsible about it, and now that is his opinion. Chapter eight, we're gonna go back to that Illinois factory. The radium, the girls in Ottawa thought, was one of the best things about their new job. Girls from all walks of life tried their hand at it, drawn in by Radium's allure. One worker was the darling daughter of a prominent physician, one of the better people. She and her friend were just there for a few days. Oh, I wonder why. The well-off women simply wanted to see what it was like to be one of the ghost girls. It was almost a voyeuristic life tourism. Radium Dial had initially advertised for 50 girls, but would eventually employ as many as 200. Ugh, more workers were needed to keep up with demand. So many girls wanted to become dial painters that the company could afford to be choosy. The practice, a former employee recalled, was to hire about 10 girls at a time and try them out. 
Out of the 10, they would usually keep about five. This is a lot of people who had casual short-term exposure. One of the girls who made the grade was Margaret Looney. Her friends called her Peg. She was good friends with Catherine Wolfe. They had gone to the same parish school. Everyone knew the Looney family. There were eight kids in the clan. That number would eventually grow to 10. And the whole family lived in a cramped house right on the railroad tracks where the roar of the trains was so frequent they didn't even think about it anymore. It's kind of like my house. It was a very tiny house. Well, theirs is smaller than mine, I'll say that. It was a very tiny house, one story, wood frame, and four rooms, basically, said Peg's niece, Darlene. It had two bedrooms and the big bedroom where the kids slept, had blankets hanging from the ceiling, separating the girls' side from the boys. There'd be three or four kids to a bed. They were dirt poor, just as poor as you could be. But they were close-knit, and they had fun. Peg, a slender, freckled redhead who was tiny in stature, was known for giggling fits. In the summer, the loony children would run around barefoot because they couldn't afford shoes. Given her family background, Peg was thrilled to land a job as a well-paid dial painter. She earned $17.50, which was the same as $242 now, every week. Good money for a poor Irish girl from a large family. And she gave her mom most of her earnings. The job meant she had to park her ambition to become a school teacher one day, but she was young. There was plenty of time to teach later on in life. Oh, it's getting harder and harder to read those sentences, y'all. They are very ominous. She had the smarts to make it as a school teacher, but she would dial paint for a time to help out at home. She had a good time at work too, painting with her friends. Peg started out like all the new girls by painting the Big Ben alarm clocks that West clocks produced. He was a rugged, handsome fellow of a clock with a dial that measured about 10 centimeters across, giving him nice big numbers for the less experienced girls to paint. As they gained in skill, they were moved on to the baby bins. These were smaller clocks about half the size and eventually to the pocket watches, the pocket bin and the Scotty, which were just over three centimeters wide three centimeters. 10 is more like that. Hmm. Peg held the dials in her hand as she carefully traced the numbers, lipping and dipping her camel hair brush as she had been taught. Sitting alongside Peg in the studio was another new joiner, Marie Becker. She had been working for the bakery downtown, but as one of her relatives observed, radium dial was the place that paid more money than anyone else. Like Peg, Marie came from an underprivileged background. After her father had died of dropsy, her mother remarried. When Marie was only 13, her stepfather set her to work. Her attitude was wonderful, a close relative said. I don't ever remember her being in a bad mood. She was an instant hit in the dial painting studio. Marie was a real character full of opinions and wisecracks. Despite her German heritage, she almost had a Spanish look to her with striking dark eyes and long brown hair. Sometimes she wore it in a bun with a spit curl on her forehead. Marie wasn't sure about staying here. On her first day at work, she was taught to put the brush in her mouth and she hated it. When she went home at lunchtime that day, she told her mother bluntly that she would not return because she just didn't like the idea of putting that brush in her mouth. But it was a short-lived reluctance for, despite her dislike of the work, she was drawn back to the studio the following day. She stayed because of the money, a relative remarked somberly. The money went to her stepfather. He was very strict, very stern man. She had to give him the money. Most girls used their money on extras, but not Marie. Marie dreamed of spending her wage on high heels. One day she had had enough. She had earned the money, not her stepfather, and she thought to herself that when she got paid that week, she would go straight to the shoe store and splurge her hard-earned cash on a pair of fabulous shoes, her very first pair of high heels. And she did just that. She even told the clerk not to bother wrapping them because she was gonna walk right out of that store with her heels on. <laughs> that relative said she knew that if she wore those shoes home, there was nothing her stepfather could do about it. 
and there wasn't. She had an argument with her stepfather and then eventually moved out when she was 17. Marie's feistiness was a sign of the times. It was the roaring 20s after all. And even in a tiny town like Ottawa, the breeze of female independence and fun times was stirring the sidewalks, blowing the winds of change. What a time to get out and see the world. Prohibition was huge. There was a lot of drinking and gambling joints, and not just that, big bands and good times. The dial painters were among those dancing to the 20th century jazz boys and later Benny Goodman. The year 1923 was when the Charleston dance craze took America by storm and the radium girls swiveled their knees with the best of them. The luminous glow of the radium on their hair and undulating dresses made those parties even more special. Catherine Wolf recalled many of the girls used to wear their good dresses to the plant so that the dresses would become luminous for when they went out to the party afterward. It wasn't just after work that the good times roared. The girls had a blast at work as well. The bosses worked downstairs, which gave the girls on the second floor free reign to have a little fun. In their lunch hour, they would go into the dark room with the leftover radium paint, and they had a swell idea for a new game. Steady yourself. We used to paint our eyebrows, our lips, and our eyelashes with the remaining radium paint and then look at ourselves in the dark room. The girls would always get fresh jars of material for the afternoon work, so they had carte blanche to use up the surplus paint from the morning. The girls would all make faces at each other and they thought it was hilarious. Charlotte Nevins remembered that they would turn the lights off and then we could look in the mirror and laugh a lot. We glowed in the dark. Yet for all the laughter, it was a strangely spooky vision. In the dark room, no daylight shone. There was no light at all except for the glowing element the girls had painted on their bare skin. All you could see was the radium. More and more girls joined them and they said they were a bunch of happy, vivacious girls. These were good, good times. Catherine's nephew remarked later, they thought it was never going to end. Chapter 9, Orange, New Jersey, June 1923. It was the Roaring Twenties in Orange, too, but Grace Fryer was not in the mood for dancing. It was odd. She had this slight pain in her back and her feet. Nothing major, but enough to make it uncomfortable for her to walk. The girls at the bank were still throwing their parties, and she tried to put it to the back of her mind. She had had a few aches and pains the year before as well, but they came and went, so hopefully these would clear up and go away for good, she thought. She had more important things to think about than an achy foot. She had been promoted at work and was now the head of her department. It wasn't just an achy foot. Back in January, Grace had gone to the dentist for a routine checkup, and he had removed two teeth. And although an infection had lingered for two weeks, her trouble did clear up. By now, six months on, a hole had appeared at the site of the extraction and was leaking pus profusely. It was painful and smelly and tasted disgusting. Grace had health insurance and was prepared to pay to get it sorted out. The doctors she felt sure would be able to fix her trouble. But had she known what was happening just a few miles away in Newark, she might have had reason to doubt her faith in physicians. Her former colleague, Irene Rudolph, was still paying doctor after doctor to treat her, but without relief. She had now undergone both operations and blood transfusions, all to no avail. The decay was eating her alive, bit by bit. She could feel herself weakening. Her pulse would pound in her ears. And although her heart was drumming faster and faster, it felt like her life was slowing down. In orange, for Helen Quinlan, the drumbeat suddenly stopped. She died on June 3rd, 1923 at her home. Her mother, Nellie, was with her. Helen was 22. And the cause written on her death certificate was Vincent's angina. This is a bacterial disease, an agonizing and progressive infection that begins in the gums and steadily spreads until the tissues in the mouth and throat, swollen and ulcerated, finally sloughs off dead. 
The doctors later said they didn't know if that was the actual condition. It had not been confirmed by laboratory reports, but it was written on her death certificate nevertheless. The name angina in its name refers to the Latin angier, meaning to choke or throttle. And that's what it felt like. That's how Helen died. This girl who had used to run with the wind in her skirts, making boyfriends gaze and marvel at her zest for life and her freedom. Six weeks later, Irene Rudolph followed her to the grave. She died at July 15th at 12 noon in Newark General Hospital. She was 21. At the time of her death, the necrosis in her jaw was said to be complete. Her death was attributed to her work but the cause was given as phosphorus poisoning, a diagnosis admitted by the attending physician to be not decisive. Now that's interesting because that one's the closest that we've gotten to a death being attributed to a chemical. The others have been attributed either to false causes or similar causes. This is the first one that gets super close to what's happening. Catherine Schaub, who had watched her cousin suffer through every stage of this terrible and mysterious illness, was angry and confused, as well as grief-stricken. The family had heard nothing. They didn't know the names of John Roach at the Labor Department or Dr. Zamatolsky that had done the tests. They knew nothing of the doctor's verdict that a warning was in order. In fact, after reviewing Zamatolsky's report, and that of the two inspectors, the Department of Labor took no action, none whatsoever. On July 18th, the Shobs buried Irene. The next day, fueled by sorrow, Catherine went to the Department of Health on Franklin Street. She had a report she wished to make, she told the official. And she told him all about Irene, her tragic death, and how Molly Maggia had died of the same poisoning a year ago. It was the United States Radium Corporation, she made sure to say, on Alden Street in Orange. Others are complaining of sicknesses, she noted. They have to point the brushes with their lips, she said clearly. The report was filed and Catherine left hopeful and assuming that something now would be done. A memo was filed about her visit, and at the end it said, a foreman at the plant by the name of Veet said her claims were not true. And that was that. It's hard to believe. Helen and Irene's deaths had not gone unnoticed by former colleagues. Quinta McDonald said, many of the girls I knew and had worked with in the plant began to die off alarmingly fast. They were all young women in good health. It seemed odd. Quinta had been Molly's sister. You might remember Molly Maggia. Now she's Quinta McDonald. She was caught up in all things family. And on July 25th, she gave birth to her second child, Robert. We were all so darned happy together, she remembered later. She and her husband, James, now had the perfect little family, a little boy and a little girl. The kid's Aunt Albina, who was still waiting for the blessing of her first child, doted on them both. Quinta had had two healthy pregnancies, and after this birth, she'd assumed that she'd get well, but instead she developed a bad back. Her ankles were bothering her. I hobbled around, she later remembered. I went to bed one night and woke up in the morning with terrible pains in my bones. She called a local doctor and he began treating her for rheumatism. His call out fee was $3 a pop, which is the same as 40 now. And she and James could have done without all this additional expense, especially given the new baby. But she couldn't seem to shake these pains. By the end of the year, she would have seen the doctor 82 times. Catherine Schaub's complaint was finally investigated as the summer drew to a close. Lenore Young, an orange health inspector, looked up the dead girl's records and found that Molly Maggia had died of syphilis and Helen Quinlan of Vincent's angina. I tried to get in touch with Veet, she said, but he was out of town. So she did nothing. She says, I let the matter drop. Hazel was still being treated for pyorrhea and still having teeth extracted. 
By now she could no longer work. Her pain was unbearable. For her friends and family, this was intolerable to watch. And for Theo in particular, who had loved her since they were teenagers, he felt like he was watching his future disintegrate in his arms. He begged her to let him pay for the doctors and the dentist that she went to, but she was unwilling to accept money from him. So, even though Hazel was very ill, he married her. He believed that if she was his wife, he would be more able to take care of her. They stood before the altar together and he promised to love her in sickness and in health. This new bride wasn't the only radium girl suffering that fall. In October 1923, Marguerite Carlo, still working at the studio, developed a severe toothache that made her face swell up. And in November, another young woman fell ill. Catherine Schaub said, I began to have trouble with my teeth. She had seen firsthand what Irene went through, and when her mouth started to ache, it must have shot a bolt of terror right through her. Absolutely, it would have. On November 17th, she went to the same dentist who had treated Irene. He examined her and then added in the file, patient has been employed in radium works in Orange, same place as Miss Rudolph. She was told to come back soon, and she did, again and again. Following the tooth extraction, her gums failed to heal, and she returned very frequently to Dr. Barry's office, five times within that same month. It was $2 per visit, which came out, which would be $27 now. The extraction had cost $8, $111 in our money. Catherine wasn't stupid. I kept thinking about Irene, she said, and about the trouble she had had with her jaw. There was clearly some relationship between Irene's case and mine. Irene had necrosis. She died. Her imagination now becomes a constant flickering reel, silently playing out what must lie before her. She was seriously shocked and a severe nervousness developed. It affected her mental health. This didn't improve when December 16th, 1923, Catherine O'Donnell, another former coworker, passed away. The doctors said that she died of pneumonia and gangrene of lung, but Catherine didn't know for sure. So many girls were ailing. Grace Fryer was now complaining that although her jaw had gotten better, the pain in her back and her foot was worse. Everyone saw that her gait, which had always been confident and unhindered, had changed. She was limping. Her parents insist that Grace go see a doctor and she made an appointment for January 5th, 1924. By Christmas, 1923, Marguerite Carlo felt at her wit's end. Y'all listen to this. Lip pointing had been stopped in late 1923. Josephine Smith, the forelady revealed, when the company warning was given about pointing brushes in our mouths, it was explained to the girls that this was because the acid in the mouth spoiled the adhesive. <laughs> so even when they take this step to protect the girls, they don't tell them an honest reason. They make up something stupid about the acid, which would have been discovered in the four or five years prior. They make up this stupid excuse. Marguerite followed the new orders, but on the job, she couldn't concentrate anymore. She had extreme fatigue. She was pale and weak and her toothache that had started in October was driving her insane. Unable to eat, her weight had begun dropping off at an alarming rate. And when she left work on Christmas Eve, she didn't know it, but it would be for the last time. That evening, she visited her dentist. There were two teeth especially hurting her and her dentist advised that both should be removed that same day. Marguerite consented to the extraction. And when her dentist pulled out the tooth, a piece of decayed jawbone came out with it. She was not going back to the studio after that. She went home to her family and tried to tell them what had happened. So Christmas was a sober, solemn day, but at least they were all together. Unbeknownst to the Carlos or any of the dial painters that same month, the U.S. Public Health Service issued an official report on radium workers. It noted that no serious defects had been found among the staff that they had examined, 
but there had been two cases of skin erosion and one case of anemia among the nine technicians studied. As a result, it made a formal recommendation to the nation, to New Jersey and Illinois, to Connecticut, where the Waterbury Clock Company was painting its own dials, and to all the places where radium was used. Safety precautions, this report said, should most definitely be undertaken by those handling radium. That's the end of chapter nine. I think we'll go one more. Chapter 10, Ottawa, Illinois, 1923. So we're back to Illinois. The caretaker at Radium Dial wiped his hands down his work shirt. He was covered in luminous material, his clothing stiff with it. The only clear spots on his face were where two big drools of chewing tobacco ran down his chin. He liked to chew as he worked, and he wasn't the only one. The dial painters kept candy on their desks, snacking between dials without washing their hands. These were Ottawa high school students. They would work sometimes one summer between high school years from a few to several weeks just to earn a bit of pocket money. As in Orange, the girls all encouraged their friends and family to join them. The pay was good and the environment was friendly. The exception to these teenagers was Pearl Payne, a married woman from nearby Utica. She was 23 when she started, a good eight years older than some of her colleagues. She had married Hobart, a tall, slender electrician, and she described him as a fine husband. Pearl was the eldest girl of 13 children, and although she had had to leave school at age 13 to earn money from the family, she said, quote, during my employment, I attended night school and a private teacher completing seventh and eighth grade in one year of high school, and her education didn't stop there. During the war, she had gained a nursing diploma and was all set to start a career at a Chicago hospital when her mother was taken ill. Pearl had to quit to care for her. Now her mom had recovered. Pearl was returning to work and dial painting, which was better paid than being a nurse, was what she ended up doing. It was such a lovely atmosphere there that Peg Looney found herself falling for the job and forgetting all about her ambition to become a school teacher. She was extremely conscientious and would even take dials home to paint y'all. Now the material is just getting everywhere. Carefully tracing the numerals in that cramped house next to the railroad tracks that she shared with her large family. She looked after us real good, remembered her sister Jean. The sisters all agreed. She was everything you'd hope a big sister would be. Peg not only brought her wages and her work home, but also the games that she had learned at the studio. She entertained the younger siblings with, let's go in the dark, revealed her niece. And there they would go, a glowing little row of loonies with radium mustaches. <sighs> Everyone wanted to work at the studio. That's why Pearl Payne was so disappointed when after only eight months as a dial painter, she had to leave to nurse her mother again. Oh, girl, it's a blessing. Get away, get away, go nurse your mother. Uh, she wasn't there when later in the 1920s, the radium dial bosses took a company photograph. Three rows of dial painters, as jolly a bunch of girls as there ever was. Many had their hair bobbed short in the latest flapper style. They wore drop-waisted dresses embellished with long scarves and strings of pearls. All the girls sat still for the photographer. Some hugged or interlinked their arms. Camera shutter closed, capturing them all together, frozen in time for just one moment. The girls of Radium Dial outside their studio, forever young and happy and well, on the photographic film, at least. That's the end of our chapters. My goodness, you guys, this is heavy. Heavy, heavy, heavy. So I hope you'll continue to join me for these chapters. It is sobering, it is challenging, but I do hold out hope that as we get towards this part of the story, there will be some justice. There will be some measures put in place that will bring about protection. And that ultimately a lot of our workplace laws that we have now may have been impacted by these terrible 
circumstances. So let's hold out hope. Let's gird our loins for the rest of this story. I hope you'll continue to join me. I hope if you're new that you'll go ahead and hit the subscribe button and join us for the rest of this story. We'll see you guys soon. Have a great day.